Over the last 50 years, we've become far more skilled at forecasting the weather. We can predict with increasing certainty what will happen for up to a week in advance and actually get it right. The use of satellite imaging allows us to follow weather systems across the globe, but beyond a week that reliability falls away dramatically. To most forecasters, the idea we can confidently predict the climate months ahead, let alone years or decades, is still the stuff of science fiction. If we talk about global warming, uh, 20,000 years ago was the, the real daddy of global warming when we went from sea levels 130 metres lower than they are now to what they are at the present time. Uh, the great ice sheets that were in North America down to uh, St Louis and uh, Vancouver and, and New York, uh, a kilometre of ice over the Great Lakes, and that all just then receded, and we've now got the, the climate we have now. So if you talk about dangerous climate change, that was dangerous, but uh, there's no... Uh, idea of why that happened. And it's scary, I guess. It seems a mild and reasonable position, but the consensus builders regard such views as heresy. And you're listening to the Science Show. On the ABC's ABC. Robin Williams Robin is Williams. Australia's most influential science broadcaster, talking to me now, a gatekeeper it's between scientists and public opinion. This short-term and people like Bill Kinnamanth well. rarely get to air. Don't and how much does value. that worry you, the, what, what's going on? Is it a really big problem or not? Either way, either the pot boiling or, or, or <laughs> simmering. Dr Kinnamont, you're talking about, are you? Yes, I am. I thought you were, yeah. <laughs> I've been uh, in various uh, conferences with him. Uh, he's made a few statements which I've checked up, and they haven't stood the test. And so, four decades of learning is like cast aside. The arena now is... Uh, uh, climate change and global warming due to carbon dioxide. It's, carbon dioxide is being promoted as dangerous. So if that's the agenda on the public agenda, uh, it's very rarely that I get the opportunity to put these, these views. You're not invited to a, a, a public uh, a meeting to, to put the side of the argument. And what is happening, says Kinnamonth, is what has always happened. There is nothing humans can do to make our chaotic and sometimes savage climate conform to a benign computer model. The hazards of climate will continue whether or not we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there will still be hurricanes like uh, went through Burma, there will still be floods, there will still be droughts, there will still be heat waves and be frosts. Uh, we've got to face that those are the natural hazards of climate and we've got to be prepared and resilient to them. By cutting back on our ability to use energy, our ability to use uh, technology, we make ourselves as a community less resilient. Tim Flannery is a paleontologist. He studies ancient flora and fauna. He's not a climate scientist, yet he feels qualified to say Kinnanmonth, the weatherman, is wrong. No one can predict the weather three months ahead, that's absolutely true. But if I asked you, is January next year likely to be warmer than June this year, what would you say? I'd have no idea. You would say yes, because that's what we always see. Summers are warmer than winter. And in terms of gen predicting general global trends, that's exactly the sort of science we're doing. It's not like predicting the weather on a certain day three months out. It's like predicting whether January is likely to be warmer than June. But that's just assumption, isn't it? Because we, we sort of assume that summer's hotter than winter. It always is. It always has been. It's a good theory, well grounded in the reality we all experience. If the year in question was 1815, Flannery's assumption would have been dead wrong. In that year, the northern winter was warmer than the summer. And 200 years of scientific debate later, we still don't know why. The answers, or the lack of them, lie deep in the ocean. And it's the oceans that are actually the driver of the climate. The uh, solar radiation is absorbed in the ocean surface and it's how the currents deploy that, uh, some of that energy and how it's released back into the atmosphere that determines the atmospheric circulations. If the doomsayers are right, then this spot by the end of the century will be totally submerged in a catastrophic sea level rise of up to six metres. What's missed in this analysis is how little we actually know about what's going on beneath the ocean's surface. It's only in the past five years we've begun to systematically record the temperature of the oceans at depth. And so far the data shows no appreciable rise in temperature whatsoever. Since the middle 80s there's been uh, more buoys across the Pacific which has given us a big handle on El Nino and La Nina and so forth. 
But uh, in terms of a global observations network, it really is only the last five years since the Argus buoys have been uh, deployed that we're getting information from how the, the, the subsurface circulations vary. But of course, we're taking the temperature of the sea every day so we can really find out, and lo and behold, weren't the computer models right. Such qualifications become lost in the translation of science to the popular culture of climate change, which relies heavily on simple linkages between data and the global crisis. I'm not so sure that any national government can protect something like the Great Barrier Reef from what lies ahead. It looks like this. It's called coral bleaching. But science is rarely 